Yeah. All right, we are here now for our uh, for the lunch portion. I'm going to turn it over uh, to Steve uh, to Steve Merrill to introduce our uh, our first speaker and take it away, Steve. And there's oh, and there's Max Sire. Take it away, Steve. Great. So. Um, I'm Steve Merrill, and I work with Artie and Stewart as the executive director of the Center for Innovation Policy, and we have another uh, banquet of riches um, persons. Um, two great keynote speakers, Marjorie Blumenthal from Rand and Max Dyer from the Partnership for Public Service. The way this is going to work is uh, definitely each speak for about 15 or 20 minutes, and then we'll open it up for discussion. You have Marjorie's um, bio, uh, but I wanted to say a word about something that uh, uh, the work of Marjorie that I know best as a colleague, a uh, longtime colleague at the National Academy of Sciences, where she was the founder and director of the Computer Science and Telecommunications Board, um, which, um, if, you, if you look on their website, uh, the list of topics that they've addressed over uh, how long is CSD been in existence? So it is impressive on just about all the subjects we've discussed this morning. Uh, and all those you could imagine, the future directions of technology, the research impacts, um, where we've come from and how uh, research and capital and human capital needs uh, agendas, um, computer science in relation to other fields, including uh, not, other, uh, not only other technical fields like biology, but also the arts trust, security, privacy issues. Um, but the one thing I wanted to point out is that um, CSDP has delved deeply into a whole range of federal agencies and their IT needs and practices. Um, I just wrote a, a list down, FAA, the intelligence community, CMS, Social Security, DOD, FBI, IRS, and even the Library of Congress. So if there is anybody who has in this whole uh, audience who has a very broad understanding of IT and the federal government, it's Marjorie. Well, thank you very much, Steve, for that incredibly gracious uh, introduction. I, I'm really very pleased to be here today. I, I've often been a consumer of Duke Law uh, publications uh, from its faculty, mostly because of the work that Steve mentioned, my interest in information policy, internet policy, uh, and so on. But I, I welcome this conference as an opportunity to pull together some ideas in areas and ways that I thought hadn't been done. And so, as, as Steve said, I'm going to take a, a broader perspective. You know, we just went through a specific use case. There will be others. And I want to look a little bit more at, at the bigger picture. Because I currently sit near the Pentagon, that may be a reason why I'm often hearing about artificial intelligence and national security. I do think the civilian side is uh, under attended to, uh, but there are obviously, as we've been hearing all day, uh, a number of opportunities to do better. As Steve mentioned, I've had a lot of exposure on the research side. That's how I first met uh, Ed Felton. And uh, I will nevertheless not be focusing on, on research, although I, I did have the privilege uh, through that work that Steve mentioned of, of meeting a number of key figures in, in AI history. I, I should note, as a history note, I learned only recently that Rand had hosted some of those founding fathers uh, in the middle of the last century when it used to bring in scholars for summer study. So, Part of my own homework is to understand a little bit more about what, what my new institution has done. So I'm going to cover two broad areas, sort of in two parts of what I want to say. 
one, uh, and, and Steve hinted at some of what animates my interest, is to look at uh, the, the history of how we've gotten here, uh, and the other is to think about what it is that, that people in public administration do. And again, we, we're hearing sort of cherry-picked examples, and maybe there's a way of generalizing from that. So because I did take this opportunity to collect my thoughts, I'm being a little bit more old school. Uh, I'm not like some of the speakers who regularly talk on this particular topic. I hope that my next talk on the topic, I will be farther along, uh, but, but bear with me on that. So in terms of history, how did we get there? How did we get here? Uh, today's uh, AI mania can sometimes make it seem like we're dealing with something new, but I think you've heard a little bit about this earlier today. AI did not uh, spring into public view ab ovo, either as a technology or as a tool for the administrative state. Today, it is easy to think about the government as lagging when it comes to uh, information technology at least as compared to the private sector. But the administrative state is actually responsible uh, in some ways for today's opportunities. So civilian government had early important influences because it was a driver of what used to be called automated data processing. That's for the obvious reason, and we heard a little bit about this in the last panel, that the government collects, stores, and analyzes a lot of data. That data can be about people, as we heard, but also can be about economic activity, products, environmental trends, uh, and, and so on. So that reality of data collection as a mission drove the federal government as uh, a pioneer in what was at least precursors of AI and sometimes early instances of AI. So that data centricity really makes the administrative state a prime candidate for the use of AI. So to consider a few examples, uh, the data analytic needs of the census provided a motivation for early mechanization of how we handled data, including uh, early calculating machines in the late 1800s coming from the precursor of what is today's idea. <coughs> If we fast forward today, people are talking about how technology may be used to enhance the 2020 census, and there is consideration of using IBM's Watson, for example, to assist in census call center operation, as an example. Like the census, what became the Social Security Administration turned to IBM to develop a collator for handling Social Security paper records in 1937. The SSA got its first computer in 1955. Again, fast forwarding, today AI is being integrated into the management of hearings, <coughs> and there are plans for using machine learning to help achieve what the SSA is calling a 360 degree view of the people that it serves. <coughs> the last example I'll call out, and this anticipates a, a speaker that you'll hear from later, is the National Library of Medicine. And NLM often is underappreciated as an innovator in IT, but the fact that I point to it should be a reminder that library and information science uh, has long driven analysis of text as well as data, numerical data. NLM acquired a Honeywell computer in 1963 to assist in its automation of indexing and cataloging of biomedical information. It developed a unified medical language system in the 1980s, which facilitated biomedical natural language processing worldwide. In some ways, those observations a little bit echo some of what we heard about in terms of discussion of, of patents as data earlier. Given the long history of government computing, the challenge of modernizing computing in the government is also not new, although it does seem more urgent if we're going to make the most of AI. Uh, by the mid-1980s, it was clear that major civilian government systems uh, aimed at processing vast amounts of data, such as IRS and SSA, needed an overhaul. And as Steve mentioned, I had the privilege at the National Academies of, of working on uh, such agency challenges. So in, in the 1990s, there was tax systems modernization, which was supposed to be a $10 billion, 10-year program uh, that did grind to a halt. And th 
this year's uh, tax season uh, glitch uh, points out very, in very real ways that the challenge remains. <laughs> of course, modernization today could be an opportunity to leapfrog and facilitate the adoption of AI. I looked at Social Security Administration uh, modernization the same period as Steve had noted. It also presents enduring challenges and opportunities as they document in their own report from uh, last year. The 1990s saw with the commercialization of the internet backbone in 95 and falling IT costs, the rise of the digital or e-government vision and the intensification of efforts in both the White House and the Congress to improve the acquisition and management of IT systems. That of course seems to be an evergreen challenge. And as you heard earlier, effective AI depends on having good IT infrastructure in the government as in the private sector. Getting closer to today, the 2010s have reinvigorated the modernization interest. There's the challenging of the monolithic systems perspective that has long dominated uh, government IT procurement. At the White House, the 2009 to 2015 period saw the appointment of the first White House Chief Technology Officer, the first White House Level Chief Information Officer, the first federal data scientist. The reason I call out these figures is that having them in place provides a leadership kind of evangelism so that people have a point of presence and uh, a way to move forward uh, from within the administrative state. Although we've just heard about limitations for use of, of Amazon Web Service Cloud, uh, it is also the case that in that same interval, 2011 saw the Cloud First policy so that for a number of agencies, their use of cloud uh, has been encouraged, and that may facilitate the use of AI where that is permitted because the cloud makes it easier to ingest and, and analyze data. <coughs> new, working, uh, new ways of working with data and technology um, have also been propagated by new mechanisms. So in the last few years, uh, there's the 18F support team, the Presidential Innovation Fellows, the U.S. Digital Service, these are all vehicles for providing expert help, um, often recruited for that purpose. I do want to pause on 18F and the Presidential in Innovation Fellows because they are part of the arsenal of assistance that comes from the General Services Administration. And in some ways, the GSA, which doesn't get a lot of attention, is, is a handmaiden uh, of the administrative state and a supporter of what it does with technology, including ultimately artificial intelligence. Most recently, this administration has also addressed federal IT modernization, but it remains to be seen how much it will be concerned with AI. Its initial outputs, uh, particularly this year, have focused on networking and cybersecurity, both very important issues, uh, but what they're doing in AI uh, remains to be in focus. The final comment about how we got here is a pointer to the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is part of the Department of Commerce. Uh, so different from the operational help provided by GSA, NIST has long helped to raise the floor on government's use of IT. It produces federal information processing standards, particularly on issues relating to cybersecurity. And it also convenes government and industry to talk about major directions in technology, whether it's how to conceptualize cloud computing or how to advance uh, in the implementation of smart city technologies. Today, NIST is relevant to AI because it is working on fostering trust in AI, especially machine learning systems. It is looking for standardized approaches that promote reliability and safety. Uh, including, as it often does, protections for security, privacy, resilience, and so on. So NIST addresses such questions as how should AI be tested? NIST is all about metrology. And how does one know when the results are good enough? Um, questions that uh, echo some of the discussions earlier today. NIST also supports development of data standards and, and practices, including data repositories that might be used by AI developers, along with challenge problems, benchmarks and, and test beds. So that's all I want to say about the landscape and how we get there from the federal IT side. 
taking uh, another perspective, I want to look at what the administrative state does, uh, since administrative state is a great buzz phrase, and what's interesting to me is that I defined that before coming here broadly, and I realized that some of the lawyers here, I think, take a possibly narrower perspective. Um, but I wanted to look broadly at the functions of public administration, because in a way, looking at those functions can provide a roadmap for thinking about where people may go uh, with AI. So one area um, is planning and strategy formulation. And planning was an early target for AI development, although there are people who say that the technology to support planning still remains uh, a work in, in progress. But an aspect of planning and, and strategy formulation is something called foresight, when people look at emerging technologies and they look at the implications of major trends, whether they're demographic, environmental, or what have you. I was able to attend a meeting a few months ago by something called the Federal um, Foresight Community of Interest, which is largely a collection of people from agencies who, who are interested in the practice of foresight. And the discussion focused on <coughs> what that community could do to benefit from AI. We saw a demonstration of a particular service that combined uh, machine learning and a chat bot, so natural language processing, and digested masses amount, massive amounts of data generally from published material to help illuminate trends that might be useful to strategic planning. So the next uh, area that, that's worth bearing uh, in mind is finance and budget analysis. And here, as in the private sector, one can imagine different uses of pattern recognition. Um, third, there's a broad area of service design and delivery, uh, especially when thinking about uh, improvements to public benefit systems. So there's everything from fraud detection, which of course depends on, on pattern recognition um, and compliance analysis more generally or prediction of need. And as we heard a little bit in the last panel, prediction works best when you have historical data that is going to have relevance as you think about what might happen tomorrow. So getting a little bit more specific, we already see predictive policing activities at all levels of government. And we see things like health services hotspotting, you know, looking at where are needs going to occur on a geographic basis and by, by kind of need. This is the kind of thing that can be helped with, um, with machine learning. And then you may hear later about all the different ways that electronic health information can be used. Um, obviously, the prime candidates at the federal level are the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, uh, the Office of the National Coordinator for Information Technology, the Veterans Department of Veterans Affairs, all of which are trying to see what can be done to make better use of, of health information. Um, another area, of course, is regulation, a uh, topic in which a number of people in the room have, have done some work. Um, one can wonder about how AI can help alleviate the burden of regulation by improving its targeting, uh, as well as by improving rulemaking processes, such as by sifting through comments that are received, assuming, of course, that you can be sure that those comments were generated by a human, and as we've learned recently, that may not yet be the case. Um, I will leave to others whether we may achieve machine um, executable regulation, uh, which would take less code as law to some new level. The fifth and the last component of the public administration picture I'd like to highlight is citizen engagement. GSA, which I mentioned earlier today, has a citizen tech program which supports experimentation with voice interaction using systems like Alexa. There are other instances of chatbots using <coughs> Watson. There already are several states that, that use um, Alexa. So in Utah, people can get help preparing for their driver's license tests, or in Mississippi and Georgia, Alexa can be a channel for, for requesting information about government services. I think somebody earlier mentioned that it's at the local government level that people are closer to the citizenry, so you can understand the imperatives as well as um, the cost concerns that were mentioned earlier. Um, 
Of course, when it comes to interactions with citizens, attention to trust is paramount, uh, including uh, attention to both privacy and, and security. So finally, central to the administrative state is the bureaucracy, or rather the bureaucrats, the people who make up the administrative state and who give rise to the human resources functions within the government. We heard a little bit about this in the discussion of, of patent examiners, uh, for example. So AI is expected to continue the long-term automation trend, which of course, as I mentioned earlier, did start early in government offices because government is was that early collector and analyst of data. The current administration has signaled its interest in reshaping and slimming the federal workshop, so workforce. In particular, the latest president's management agenda connects taming the administrative state with more and better uses of information technology, including automation and AI. It does refer to, to reskilling, and AI has a role in helping with that through better approaches to education and training. According to the uh, President's management agenda, uh, automation pilot projects will be undertaken to demonstrate cost savings and return on investment. And the earliest steps are likely to automate what is repetitive and routine to begin with, which is something that we heard about in the context of the Bureau of Labor uh, Statistics, for example, and that might possibly play out in other statistical uh, agencies. Connected to the PMA, the Office of Personnel Management is promoting the use of IT to enhance decision making, uh, along with various steps to, quote unquote, maximize employee performance. We heard a little bit today about how there can be teaming between people and, and machines, and we heard a little bit about why that can be hard. Um, but I think overall, it's reasonable to expect new human-machine collaborations to support public administration missions. There are cadres of government uh, employees, uh, from those working on IT and data systems and mission agencies to those who are uh, in service agencies like GSA, uh, who will be dedicated to the care and feeding, if you will, of AI systems. Uh, and so we might want to monitor their career. So to wrap up, my goal today was to provide some historical perspective and to step back and look broadly at the administrative, administrative state to <laughs> what it is and what it does in general terms. Both the past and present developments underscore that the administrative state is really driven by uh, collection and analysis of data. AI, of course, depends critically on data. And accordingly, one could argue that there is a logical marriage between AI and the administrative state. The proverbial devil, of course, will be in the details. I just now realized that this drag was going to be I have to keep you in my nose. Yes. Oh. <laughs> so uh, I'll just briefly uh, introduce Max Sire. As you know, we've been dispensed with any long introduction. So he's an all-around good guy. Uh, he created the partnership for public service. So it can tell you, he knows more about agencies and the work of agencies than most anybody. But also, because I was looking at my phone, uh, four months ago, they, uh, the Public Partnership uh, issued uh, The Future Has Begun, using artificial intelligence to transform government. So when I saw this, yeah, there it is. <laughs> um, so when I saw that, I realized that we had to invite Max, uh, unfortunately, can't be here in person, so we can use our one video link. So, Max, you can take it away. I hope you can hear me. Can you hear okay? Yep. Perfect. Um, so, uh, thank you for uh, the promo on the report. I have to give credit where credit's due. And my colleague, Peter Thomasay, is the primary author of this report and therefore is uh, riding shotgun with me. And if you want real information, you'll get it directly from him. I thought I would just take a few minutes to offer some additional context. Marjorie, I thought you did a terrific job of providing a both sweep historical of what government has done uh, in, this, in the space of IT and AI, but also some of the important components of government that are engaged. My um, comments will be slightly more negative than yours in terms of uh, where I think government actually is. And I think it's important to have this context uh, in order to appreciate um, not just what we are struggling with, but also what needs to be changed uh, in order to be able to have a government that better delivers on its uh, service commitments to the public. 
uh, to start with, um, I, in, my, in my view, we have a legacy government that is largely not keeping up with the world around it. And that challenge is becoming more pronounced rather than less. Uh, and just to give you some sense more specifically around uh, the topic that we have today, um, in all of government, um, and Marjorie, one, one quibble I have is that please no one in that room talk about bureaucrats. Just as a quick aside, uh, it's the equivalent of calling lawyers, um, ambulance chasers, or doctors quacks. We did some research not long ago where we found that if you ask the public positive, negative, you say federal government worker, that number was at 71%. If you said federal government bureaucrat, that number was at 20%. So <laughs> you got a solid 50% drop in, in favorability. And so it's a word that I'm trying to eradicate in my own, in my own small way. Um, but uh, if you look at the federal government workforce, you have right now only 6% of that workforce under the age of 30. If you look in the IT workforce, literally have five times as many people over the age of 60 as under the age of 30. So just think about that for a second. Five times as many people over the age of 60 as under the age of 30 in IT in the federal government. And I think that is part of the fundamental problem that you have here, which is a workforce that has, in many ways, it's the same size in absolute terms as it was in the 1960s, despite the fact that We've not only had a very large increase in population, but the, the nature of the tasks that the government has taken on have increased substantially. Think about TSA. The balance of the workforce is now really in the national security arena um, and very many fewer people on the civilian side. Uh, and it's a broken system. The rules this year is the 40th anniversary, the 40th anniversary of the last time that we had major civil service reform. So again, think about organization you're familiar with that is succeeding on this planet and is operating under the same rules as it did 40 plus years ago. And that's what we have in the federal government. Um, at the same time, you obviously have extraordinary things occurring and we produce something called the Service to America Medals, the SAMIs, where we identify amazing, uh, talented people who are doing incredible things for the public. But that, that, that uh, achievement is going to become more and more uh, stressed as time passes. And you're seeing it more, and epi more episodically. So in my view, pretty much everything that should happen in the federal government is happening somewhere, just not in very many places. And part of the real challenge in the federal space is how you actually disseminate, how you identify, but then how you disseminate best practice across the larger enterprise. Marjorie did, a, I think, an important dichotomy. The reality is that the Defense Department, the intel community, they approach these issues in a much more uh, intensive and comprehensive way than the rest of government. Um, and there's very little, almost no, cross fertilization between the DOD intel world and the civilian side. Uh, and there's very little enterprise perspective in general. So as an example, uh, the Office of Management Budget, the central, the center of the center of government, their management team is smaller than mine here at my tiny nonprofit. Uh, and you really have neither a, an enterprise strategic plan, nor enterprise capability, nor real you know, long-term strategic thinking at all. The closest the federal environment has to uh, sort of that longer-term strategic thinking occurs at the Government Accountability Office, a legislative entity. And beyond that, it's not happening uh, uh, to speak of. So you have you know, some communities that crop up, uh, um, but they are usually fairly anemic uh, and, and and off to the side, as opposed to being central. Now, Marjorie did mention the president's management agenda. I think this administration has done a good job at putting out a management agenda, but in the sense that it recognizes this, it's one of the few areas where this administration has built on prior uh, work uh, from the last administration, rather than upending everything. So that's the positive. The negative is that, by and large, uh, it doesn't have a lot of uh, uh, significant stakeholders behind it. There's a very strong deputy uh, for management at OMB. You've got a new person at the Office of Personal Management, the head of the General Services Administration. The three of them, I think, are good uh, folk. But at the end of the day, the real action and activity happens at the agency level. And by and large, and I, there are some real exceptions to this, uh, most of the agency leaders are either one, not in place. There's still a third of the top 650 jobs in the agencies where there's not even a nominee. They barely crossed over the halfway mark to get 
half of the confirmed people in place, um, and many <laughs> have no familiarity with government previously, no real commitment to management or an understanding about the larger enterprise needs of the organizations they run. So I'm being very direct uh, and, and frank in terms of my assessment about where we stand uh, right now. And this obviously has very large implications um, to move to my second point for AI, because while you have important and uh, uh, um, innovative examples of the use of AI in the federal space, you have Alex Measure here uh, from uh, BLS. Uh, that's one of uh, the work that he's done at BLS is one of the things we highlight in our report. Um, those really are the exception rather than the rule. Um, and as Marjorie noted, there's actually a fairly long history of work that has been cutting edge in the federal environment. Peter was sharing with me that SSA entered into its first contract around AI in 1985. Uh, so you get some sense again that government obviously has been on the vanguard in many instances, but not so much right now and here today. But there are really two areas that I think are important when we think about government. It's government as consumer of AI and then government as the provider of the, of the ecosystem. And uh, I think those are different roles that are interrelated and they're both needed to focus on. And, and I think it's important for folks to recognize that if government is not a good consumer of AI, then the likelihood that it's gonna be able to regulate and support effectively is diminished substantially. So those things do in fact uh, need to be thought about um, together. So um, uh, one point to make on the government's role uh, more generally is, is, is my point earlier about how little is done in the federal space from a enterprise perspective. And there's a second point, which is even when it is done from an enterprise perspective, it usually does not have real execution legs. So um, President Obama issued a report uh, from OSTP uh, on, on, on AI that was important. Um, this administration, as I mentioned, has, has somebody at the deputy level at, o, at OMB that is you know, focusing on management. The, the, the White House and the larger enterprise perspective is one in which they, they usually manage by airdrop. They don't act, actually understand how to effectuate change from the center throughout the entire enterprise. And an effective strategy really requires active engagement of the agency leadership and agency leadership themselves on multiple levels if you expect to have real and lasting impact. And I'll come back to that lasting piece in a second here. Um, so. Uh, there is a challenge right now about both having that overall enterprise uh, focus, but also on an understanding about how to drive that throughout the whole organization. Even when you heard Marjorie talk about the president's management agenda and the intent to um, pilot different activities, one of the oddities about the government space is that the normal logic of piloting and then disseminating typically doesn't work. So you actually have lots of pilots that have been tried in the federal space lots of them that have succeeded, lots that have not, but that doesn't mean anything. No one picks that up and then actually uses that as a template uh, for the entire government. So one of my favorite examples is the, uh, the, the, the Defense Department labs have done a lot of experimentation around pay for performance, performance management. China Lake is a place where they've done a lot of interesting work in the 1980s. Everyone to this day still talks about China Lake, China Lake. It doesn't matter uh, because no one else has adopted it writ large. And my own personal example of that was my first time in government was in the early 1990s when I was in the antitrust division at Department of Justice. And among the many things that I did, yeah, the thing that probably made the biggest difference is I actually started a paralegal program at DOJ that was modeled after best practice in the private sector, which is going to sound crazy, but the norms there had been to take secretaries and promote them into uh, paralegals because that was the way to be able to move them up and to take care of your people. And my boss then, Ann Bingaman, said, that makes no sense. Why don't we hire really smart folks coming out of college for two years? Management hated the idea. We got it started. It was, you know, it was an incredible success. Uh, now, however many years later, still operating at the antitrust division and environment and natural resources, but nowhere else in DOJ. So it just gives an example, again, of how you can start something that generates real return, great result. If you have it as a pilot, you have to be thinking about what your strategy is to actually get wide scale adoption beyond simply having a good idea because that ain't good enough. Um, so uh, final point that I would make here uh, is that 
um, there is really opportunity for impact right now. Um, one of the things that I, I mentioned is the lack of enterprise perspective uh, in, 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 in our government. I do think that the kinds of forums you're, you're doing right now are incredibly important. One of the things we highlight in our report in terms of next steps forward is that I think there is a role for universities and other entities to fill this gap. Uh, the federal government isn't going to fix it on its own, and we need stakeholders on the outside to actually take an active role in trying to help the government move in the right direction. And the implications are profound, I think, for uh, both the services that the government provides, but also, again, for that ecosystem uh, it, it presents as well. Importantly, again, I think it comes back to the one of the other challenges in the federal space is that you have short-term leaders that are aligned to the long-term needs of the organizations they run. And this is part of the reason why the pilot to, uh, to scale doesn't work. Um, you know, if you have your average tenure of 18 months to two years of political leaders, you have 4,000 political leaders uh, in, you know, in, in, in theory. 1,200 of them are Senate confirmed and you got only half of them in place today. That churn means that it's really important to figure out what kind of continuity strategies you can adopt in order to be able to allow for the change that needs to take place in an organization of the scale and complexity of the federal government. And part of my view of the answer to that is entities like Duke and others helping be carriers of that message across the choppiness that the, that, that, that turnover uh, is normally creating. Uh, so um, my intent here was really to offer to sort of a few brief observations. I'd love to have a conversation and, and include Peter in that because he will be able to offer good insights about what's happening on the ground on AI in the federal environment. Great, so um, why don't we open it up to questions for Marjorie and Max and, and Peter, so if you can just get oh, my attention. Um, and I will, I will, like Lori, use whatever, whatever indicators I can to make sure if I, if I, if I, if I don't know your, uh, if I don't know your name. Okay. Uh, David Banks in the back. <laughs> So if, 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 if you identify yourself. Uh, David Banks, um, Director of Statistical and Applied Mathematics at Scientific Institute and um, faculty at Duke. Um, two small points. One, Margaret, uh, the fairness and transparency of machine learning has raised concerns about uh, predictive policing and that the present call system is under fire for lots of reasons. <coughs> Did you want Max to be a jewel here? That question. I, I think I heard enough of it that I think I'm okay. But it sounds like Marjorie's up first in yes. terms of predictive policing. So yes, I, I completely understand that predictive policing has been controversial and it is questionable in, in many ways. But what I did want to point out that it is an area where people have been trying to make use of predictive technology. I actually see. Um, various references across what I would largely call the public safety domain, um, making it as, as broad as possible. And I think there will be tussles continuously, especially coming from the civil liberties and, and privacy concerns that will push towards greater algorithmic transparency and, and reliability of approaches. But I also suspect that with all of those concerns, the pressures for people to do something and to apply these technologies in public safety, um, they're, they're not going to go away. Back to Peter. So um, if I, and again, this is the part that I got less of, but I think, if, and, and you, you will hopefully let me know if, if I'm not answering the question, there is no doubt that there are enormous use cases for AI in the federal environment. and. There are all kinds of reasons why they should happen. Um, I love, love, love the BLS example um, in that it's both providing, you know, 
better better outcomes as well as uh, you know for 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 faster and cheaper. So it's all, it's all the stuff that you actually you want to see. I think the bigger challenge in my view right now is that you don't have talent in at two levels that will be fundamental to see broader application of AI in the government. Um, one would be the the actual technical talent uh, that can 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 understand the opportunities and and actually execute against them. And more fundamental than that is that you don't have the leadership in government that is going to be or that is currently technologically savvy about the, the, the value that it can be achieved. So there's some structural issues about the upfront investments that need to be taken um, and the fact that you have so much what's unique about our system in a bad way is you have you know, such a large cohort of political appointments that clog up the system and that, that, that go many layers down from the top. Um, but the, the, it's not just the political people, it's the career folks as well. You have a insular workforce um, that doesn't have that new talent coming in that is tech savvy and has high tech expectation. And so both political and career leaders aren't going to understand the opportunity that they have, nor are they likely, and I'm talking obviously in the broadest generalities, nor are they likely to, um, to, to take on what is a very big challenge of change. And in, in the government, making change is hard. And, and in order to accomplish that, you have to be you know, in 150%. So I'm not, I think that the reality of our world will mean that there'll be increased pressure for use of AI. I just think adoption is gonna be a lot slower. Left to its own devices, the government will be a lot slower than it ought to be. And it's important to recognize what those source points of friction are. And they, they include that broader management challenge, which is why I, I opened with my comments. Um, so am I answering the question or have I missed a piece of it of relevance here? Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Well, I, I just wanted to add, add to that. The, the reason I mentioned um, entities like 18F is that it is interesting that these components now embedded under GSA have weathered the transition from one administration to another. And they offer a kind of mechanism. It's not the same as a wholesale change in um, the civil service, but they, they do embed individuals for shorter and longer periods of time um, within government agencies to help push forward innovation. It's a mechanism for making some kind of progress. The other observation I'd make is that Somebody mentioned earlier today the GAO report on um, uh, how much is spent taking care of legacy systems, and, and you just mentioned the people nearing retirement. Well, these are the same things that have been said since you know at least absolutely. And yeah, I think that we are getting to the point where there will be some kind of crisis when those people do retire. So I don't know quite what what the uh, scenario will be, but there continues to be an opportunity that's more urgent for really thinking about the structure and the composition of the federal workforce when it comes to IT. I will say that in the case of, of the IRS, my old work led to you know, a new position that focused on privacy, um, a, a systems architect's position in an office and so on. It, it's possible, those are old now examples, to at least make changes to some structure while you're also <coughs> working on the people who occupy the positions. So yeah. I, I, don't, I don't wanna be Pollyanna, but I, I have to have some optimism that we can make some useful progress. Yes, and, and to be clear, I, I would not be doing what I'm doing right now, and I didn't say what I am doing, I should probably at some point, if I didn't have optimism, because I do think that change is possible. I also think that we have to have a realistic appreciation of the problem. And you are right, I think one of the things that Obama did that was, was beneficial was to create new channels of talent uh, coming into government 18F, the United States Digital Service, the President's Innovation Fellows Program, and it all came from a crisis of sorts, which was the healthcare.gov debacle, because that was the wake-up call for President Obama to see that, hey, you know, policy's all fine and good, but if you can't get it done, doesn't do a whole lot of good. Um, 
Now, the challenge here is a lot of the steam is out of that. So while this administration has given uh, lip service uh, to continuation of this exercise of, of PIP and 18F, 18F is on its heels right now. Uh, USDS doesn't have the same kind of talent that it used to have. And at the end of the day, it's actually not full solution because unless you really get this work embedded into the agencies, you're still coming from the outside and you're not actually getting stuff done. So I'm all for you know, a belief that change is possible. I do think it is. Um, you know, the, the, but the reality is, unfortunately, when I started this organization 17 years ago, I was the guy talking about that retirement tsunami 17 years ago. And what I've learned since is that it actually isn't engine failure, it's rust. And the amazing thing to me is I had a conversation yesterday with a reporter who was asking, oh, yeah, when's the crisis going to come? You know, when we were talking about the IRS uh, and the IRS workforce and the fact that they, over the last seven years, have had an outflow of about uh, 5,000 people every year and only 500 person replacement. And I thought about it for a second. I said, hey, guess what? The crisis did happen. Guess what happened? This year on tax day, the system crashed. What more crisis do you actually want? And the reality is we are experiencing it already right now. Um, some of it is not transparent because it's very hard to see, you know, the performance information around government. But I think we're in we're in neck deep in trouble already. Uh, and and I don't think, uh, you know, generally speaking, we don't respond super well to crises. When we responded to 9/11, we created DHS, which, to my mind, was one of the worst answers because it was the reorganization answer. It really was the rearranging the debt chairs rather than dealing with the fundamental underlying issues, including Congress. You know, the one recommendation that was not adopted by the 9-11 Commission was that Congress needed to align itself against the executive branch. And it's still the case that Congress, if you think about root cause analysis of what's broken, Congress is one of my three candidates. <laughs> <laughs> you got to narrow down to three. Oh, so uh, Marjorie and Kerry touched upon this. Given that the federal government right now may be uh, in bad straits. Um, in terms of state and local initiatives, are is there learning to be had that could, you know, percolate up in the future to, uh, or would the uh, would the structural issues just be so different in, in, at federal, uh, the state and local level vis-a-vis -vis the federal level? There certainly are structural differences. I mean, you know, on the one hand, at the local level, that's where you have smart cities. And you know, they involve uh, sensors that are distributed and, and lots of functions and collection of transactional data and using those data in, in very creative ways. We could find um, ways to extrapolate from that to the federal level, although that doesn't necessarily get at the realities of the public administration functions that we've been discussing at the federal level, which tend to be more abstract. They tend to be you know, more dealing with data as opposed to dealing with the phenomena that broke the data. So I'm not sure about that. Um, the state level, the one area that, that I've begun to look at is, well, how do the states deal with cybersecurity? And you can argue that states lag the federal government. I think there are some examples where they're actually doing some creative things. But again, that's a very focused um, mission situation uh, with, with a lot of direct motivations. May or may not get at um, technology capacity other than the fact that I think states and cities have so lagged the federal government that they can leapfrog, that you know, they don't have as much of a legacy system challenge. They're going to have some, but they're going to have less, and so they may end up in a better place. Same question about communication between the military intelligence community and the civilian intelligence. Is, there, is that just a given? Well, so as we learned with 9-11 with and as um, you know, we see with IRS data, Social Security 
data, other data, there are legal limitations to information sharing. So that is not an area of my expertise, but my understanding is that persists. And I think there are also barriers to having the conversations because the civilian side is more open to a more diverse population of workers, by which I mean people who might never get a security clearance and people who could get one and maybe even have one. So once you invoke classification, it yeah. gets harder to have that conversation across the sides. Yeah, I guess my, I think that those are all real issues and the security clearance piece is profound. I mean, you're talking about now average two years in general to get a security clearance um, it's it's and there's all sorts of reciprocity issues in addition to just the clearance side I think I mean again it's, this just to um, flip rolls on, on optimism here I, I think that there are real opportunities for sharing of <laughs> capability that that go less to the you know direct programmatic than to the operational side uh, so much, though, I think really depends on the ability to get <laughs> moving in and out of the government in general, but also through the government. And that mobility piece is, to me, fundamental to actually seeing the sharing and learning that needs to take place. So just again, you know, sort of more data, the federal government has its top, you know, uh, career ranks are made up of about 7,000 what are called senior executive service folks. Today, 92% of those people come from inside the government. And of those, only 8% move agencies once they become an SES member. And they're not moving before they become an SES member. So it's a highly insular um, uh, you know, workforce uh, that um, is missing out on the experience and the information coming from both other sectors as well as, a, as across. So one of our propositions is that no one should become an SES member, should have a requirement unless the joint duty requirement, so it's really adopting something from uh, the Defense Department, unless you've actually served in multiple agencies, multiple sectors, or multiple levels of government. So there, there are proposals we have to try to create those kinds of incentives for mobility. I think that is more likely to drive that kind of information share than anything else, but we ought to try a bunch of different things. And I actually want to, I want to build on that, but I want to, there's something you said that reminded me that <laughs> there are a number of established coordination mechanisms. The ones that I'm most familiar with are on the um, R&D side, so of course there's a networking and information technology R&D uh, program that coordinates the funders of information technology R&D, but there is another one, I'm going to get the name wrong, uh, that focuses on machine learning and AI, and it is more operational. The kind of entity I mentioned before in passing the Federal Foresight Community of Interest is an illustration of other federal communities of interest. So they may not they may not go as deep as maybe what you were getting at with your question, but whether it's the informal communities of interest that exist on multiple topics or these more formal um, coordination bodies, they can at least share some information. It's, it's what they do with it that I think is a challenge. Jonathan. Um, uh, Jonathan Wiener from Duke University. I wanted to follow up on that question of foresight and, um, and also the point earlier about looking to other uh, governments and other institutions for possible examples including the state and local uh, examples that were mentioned previously. But I want to ask about internationally. We often think, in, often the framing of international uh, use of AI in the private sector or the public sector is as a competitive rival to the United States and how should the United States keep up with or stay ahead. Uh, but there's also possible uh, opportunities for collaboration or mutual learning. And I was particularly thinking on the point of foresight about uh, the government of Singapore, which has um, 
invested heavily for many years in the creation of foresight institutions, a center for strategic fores foresight and a horizon scanning function. Um, and so I was just um, curious whether there are any examples or opportunities either of you see for <coughs> that kind of you know, international <coughs> borrowing or learning or uh, mutual collaboration on um, yeah, on, on, on better foresight and better use of these um, methodologies. So let me separate the specific from the general. On the specific question of foresight, my observation and talking with colleagues who, who really are into foresight is that there are these wonderful international examples like Singapore, and we don't have counterparts. But there certainly is a community of people in this country, in and out of, of government, who care about foresight, and they communicate internationally. But if I then pivot to the general question of what can we learn from other countries that might relate to how our government adopts um, AI, then I think the door is open to more examples. So as um, Max had mentioned, you know, the, the US Digital Service was modeled after the UK Digital Service. So it's an obvious example. We participate in the OECD uh, which has the developed countries coming together. They've had um, a variety of efforts that have been concerned with the evolving prospects and uses for information technology. The digital economy is a current focus. AI is considered as a part of that. So we at least participate in those discussions to, to varying degrees. Um, I will say at the same time, because of differences in outlooks and priorities and acknowledgement of competitive concerns, you know, it's, it, I think some of these participations are, are at arm's length. I think the more interesting question today comes from looking at the fact that China has published an AI strategy, you know, what it wants to do in, by the middle of the century and how it will combine everything from leadership in R&D to use of intellectual property. And you know, the people in this room know better than I do that you know, Chinese patenting has certainly been, been increasing in AI-related topics as, as well as others. So since the 1980s, we, we don't really have industrial policy in the same way. And as long as we don't, uh, it's hard for us to learn from countries that do, but I think there is some intergovernmental discussion about what this evolving landscape means, especially because that Chinese strategy is out there as a kind of challenge and a, and a, and a set of questions that you know, people should be responding to. So we just have two minutes, and I have one quick question. Might, this might be more for you, Peter, than, um, than Max, but in your report, which I commend to everybody, you have a, a bunch of examples of how AI has actually worked in various agencies. Can you abstract from that and give us a thumbnail sketch of what it is those have in common? So are there concrete lessons that we, can, that we really can learn? Is, is, is it, obviously, none of us should be too optimistic for all the reasons that are articulated, but is there anything that you can articulate? Here's a few things those have in common that really do seem to, 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 to grease the skids. For AI, I mean. Peter. Right. Uh, I, I'd like to go back to the previous question for a second of what the federal government could learn from state and local governments within the United States. Uh, one of the examples that we have in our report is Johnson County, Kansas, and how they are using AI to identify at risk people, people at risk of going to jail. Uh, they were able to connect different departments within the county and use their data collectively to build an AI system that identifies those people. Of course, I'm not suggesting that Johnson County, Kansas is the same scale as the federal government, but in Johnson County, they were able to build a shared vision around serving the same citizen and then bridge those gaps uh, within departments. So I think that's something uh, that the federal government can learn, sharing that vision and uh, again, just like the Chinese government publishing a, a shared vision for how the federal government could use AI. That's something uh, the federal government could learn from state and local governments. Uh, the one thing that 
probably all of our interviewees highlighted uh, is that AI is not magic. Uh, almost all of them use this phrase, AI is not magic. Uh, and I think that's the biggest takeaway from a report is that it takes a lot of work. Uh, it's not the solution to every single problem. It's a solution to some problems, uh, but you shouldn't just apply it like a peanut butter spread to everything, uh, <laughs> every problem that you have in government. You know, but why did it happen in those cases and not other places? Are there other commonalities? Right. Uh, what Johnson County had was very strong leaders at the top of the county who pushed that shared vision onto the departments that were working under him uh, to make sure that they see that they are serving the same citizen, uh, whether it's you know a corrections department, a police department, a health department. So it was leadership from the top um, that made Johnson County stand out. Yeah, I, I would say more generally, in any transformation we see in the in the federal space, it's always the leaders. And the challenge again is the leadership um, is both uh, not equipped to understand the opportunity here by and large, and it's also shifting through so quickly at the very top that they're not invested. These things also take a fair amount of time. The runway is is lengthy to get this stuff done, and you need people who are aligned to longer term investments, which you you don't have at the top. All right, on that cheery note, thank you very much for the <laughs> <laughs>